Um, next up, uh, we have our community moment. <clears throat> If you're new to Oasis, a community moment is an opportunity for someone from our group to come up and share a thought, an idea, an experience. Sometimes it's really funny, sometimes it's really serious. And I invite you all, if you want to do one, it's 10 minutes or less, you would have months to plan it, please let me know. I'd love to get you on the schedule. We'd love to have your voice. Today we have a veteran community moment speaker, Sarah Israel. A little bit about Sarah, she works in the healthcare industry and her hobbies are bicycling and exercise. I asked for three words to describe her and they decided to give me like these humongous words. I don't know if it's because they want to hear me stumble over it or just to make things interesting. So here we go, three words to describe Sarah. Disestablishmentarian, licentious, and gastroverbose. However you want to take that. <laughs> warning label. If she had a warning label, it would be, this is why we can't have nice things. Please welcome Sarah Israel. So about a week ago, she asked me for a title, and I could not think of a title for this thing. So Windows or Google gave me one. So that was very kind of it. So sorry, Helen, I couldn't think of a title. Um, we have a lot of activists in our group. Um, I wanted to talk to you about my activism. We have in this group everything from atheism, secular humanist, to Daryl Ray, and I've said what he does. Um, <laughs> so in 2011, JJ had actually come to me and he says, you know, there's this group in Missouri and they're collecting signatures to try to get the legalization of marijuana, something that we can vote on in November. I thought you might be interested. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. So I joined a group called Show Me Cannabis Regulation, quickly became pretty active active volunteer through them. Um, it stands, uh, SMCR is what they're called. Now they've dropped off the regulation because we didn't get the initiative on the ballot that year. So they've been active in the state doing a lot of other things. They delivered 360,000 change.org petitions to Governor Jane Nixon to get a prisoner, Jeff Mazansky, who had been serving since 1993 for marijuana only related crimes. Um, they got him released from prison, um, but not before his family had grown up. They also, in 2014, when CBD oil became legal for seizures in Missouri, they were able to sit in on their influence with that group. They were able to make Missouri one of only two states, Florida's the other one, that we can actually grow and distribute our own marijuana to make that oil. Um, now, cannabis oil is legal in all 50 states. Uh, they also got a half a dozen law reform measures through the Missouri General Assembly in the year of 2014. They're still an active group, and if you ever need to somewhere to look for research and education on law reform and, and cannabis laws, Show Me Cannabis is the place to go. So there's, whoop, there's me happily doing the things that I did through them. I did volunteer training with volunteers throughout the state. I coordinated um, where they would be going, where they would be volunteering, what they'd be doing. I organized events where we would go out and collect signatures. Uh, then came the validation of those thousands, 100 and, well, actually we collected 65,000 signatures and every single one we had to look at and compare against a list of voter registries and make sure that each signature would count. So, you know, Kate with her beer, she sweat a lot. I just had a lot of paperwork all the time. My house at times was just covered in papers. Um, so through SMCR, Casey Normal kind of started to notice me and asked me to be their vice president. So I became the vice president of Kansas City Normal. And through them, we did things, it was more of an education and outreach group. So we did things like Hemp Fest, which is a one day festival um, to, to bring awareness. We had speakers come into our monthly meetings, things like that. Um, through SMC, or through Casey Normal, I started meeting patients. And this was kind of a pivotal moment when I started meeting people that were really sick and using this. Um, so this group here uh, is from Kansas. We worked with them to, Kansas doesn't have the petitioning. You have to go to a rep and get them to introduce an idea on the floor of the house to get it voted on. So it's much more difficult out there, obviously. But we helped them to try to get medical marijuana out there. We held a rally at the state building. One of the gentlemen that I met, um, he was always referred to as impatient patient. He had cancer and AIDS that he was treating just to have some semblance of a quality of life before he was terminal, so he knew. Um, this guy didn't 
care anymore. He would drive around with a tray of pot on his floorboard and smoke in public. Um, we were coming out of the state building one day after talking to some reps, and we, there's cops around his car, and we're all like freaking out, like, do we walk the other way? What do we do? Like, just wait for him to go away. Well, he had a puppy, and someone had thought the puppy was like getting hot in the car. So luckily, my friend had thrown a jacket over his tray, and the cops are just like, oh yeah, your dog's fine, and went about their merry way, and we were just like sweating bullets, and so glad to be done with that. Um, but I met patients, parents with sick kids that they were using to treat seizures, things like that, old people, young people, everyone. Uh, today, so I want to talk to you about kind of what mar medical marijuana actually looks like because it's not just treated with, with smoking. It's a very new field. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that, a little bit about it, why our policy isn't sufficient, and give you some resources of ways that you can help. So all of us have in our system, you know, you have neurons that have receptors and chemicals that act on them. Well, you have cannabinoid receptors, and you have CB1 and CB2. So one is through your neural tissue, it's in your forebrain, this one acts on pain, movement, cognition, it helps with, with if someone is, has um, like CP and muscle contractures or, or spasms. They're just, this is the one that when the chemicals act on it, it helps you to be able to eat. CB2 is discovered a couple years later in 92. It's in your immune tissue. They discovered in 2006, so very recently. We're still learning a lot about this. Very recently, they discovered that it's in the brain as well. Uh, at first, they only thought it was in, this, in the immune tissue. This one tells, works with cell signaling, apoptosis, which is cell death. They found that this one can tell cells that don't belong to die. Um, it can move cells to an area where they need help with, with immunity. It can... Um, help with the inflammatory response, so like uh, arthritis, things like that, it helps actually get that tissue damage to stop and repair itself, which is unique to any over-the-counter medications or prescriptions we have. It's still, the damage just stops. It doesn't actually reverse and repair it. Um, the discovery of these throughout the membrane perturbation theory, which was that kind of like the way anesthesia works, that the chemicals lodge into the fat cells to cause the effect that they do. They thought, well, that's mu that must be how weed works, but it's not. There's actually this whole system in everyone. So the cannabinoids, we have five that are endogenous in humans. That means we make them. <laughs> you guys are laughing at the height causer. I see it. <laughs> so the ones that we make that we know of so far, they function for memory, appetite, energy, metabolism, stress response, anxiety, social behavior, immune function, female reproduction, sleep, thermal regulation, pain relief, and the atomic nervous system. So a lot of systems use this, use this just throughout your whole body. So cannabis, these are the, there's 113 so far that they found in the plant, but these are the main two that we're going to talk about. THC, the high causer, that's the one that makes you feel euphoric and feel good, takes care of a lot of pain, and then cannabidiol, CBD, is the one that really acts on the disease processes itself. So I went to a normal meeting a couple months ago, or a couple weeks ago, it might have been, you know, yesterday or last year sometime. Um, <laughs> And they had this, handed out this neat little wheel here, and I'm going to post this on the group so you guys can take a closer look sometime later. And you can kind of see cannabidiol, what it does. It tends to um, reduce inflammation, inhibits cancer cell growth, things like that. THC is more like relieves pain, makes you not feel nauseous and, and like, like vomiting. And these guys that, are, that presented, they sell CBD oil in Kansas City illegally. Um, they're going to be talking later at Aquarius Books today at 2 o'clock. So I would recommend catching that. It's very informative. So we also have synthetic THC, drobinol, marinol. Senta, our very own Senta, was able to use this to help herself eat during her recovery and, and her chemotherapy. And if we've seen the results of shrinking Senta, and that was no good. So she, she did really well with that. So you might be wondering, well, we, we have all this, so why, what's wrong with the laws? Um, the problem that we face is that they're not enough. A lot of these work through what's called an entourage effect, meaning that the chemicals work together, but they work best when they work together rather than pulling out THC and only using it for the nausea or, or to eat better. Um, we also need research because right now, with, like the American Shaman guys that do this, they can collect their data. They can recommend to this patient, hey, this guy has done this and this guy's done that, and it works, but... I know you guys, so when do we want it? We want evidence-based change. When do we want it? After peer review. We need, we need to have research on this so that we know where to go and so that they can start discovering more of the cannabinoids and how they work. Um, also, just our patients are still getting 
there was a little girl, her parents were treating her with the CBD oil. She had 30 seizures a day, got down to nothing. They went to the neurologist and he's like, what is going on? Like, this is amazing. And they said, oh, well, we're using CBD oil, perfectly legal, bought here off the shelf in Kansas City. And he said, well, I'm going to have to report you. So they're, they're being investigated and might possibly lose their kids because of that. So what can we do to help change these things? Well, first off, as any activism, write your legislators. Find out who supports medical, find out who supports full legalization, support them in that. You can donate your time. I used to be a stay-at-home mom, so I had a lot more flexible time than I do now, so I haven't been very active for a while, but any spare time that you, can, you have is very helpful. You can donate money to these organizations, SMCR, uh, Normal, Kansas City Normal. They're all 501c3s. They depend completely upon donations from us. You can speak up. As I said, a lot of these people are sick. They're taking care of kids. They're taking care of their parents. They don't have time to go and lobby their legislators. They're just working day to day to make sure that they can live a life that's at least somewhat comfortable. Um, you can send a petition. There's a group called New Approach Missouri that I'm working with. I have the petition back at the sound table. So if you guys want to, we're, we're trying to get on the ballot this year that we will have a medical uh, initiative. We will legalize medical cannabis in Missouri. Uh, the, the whole initiative is on there. So if you want to read it, you feel free to take your time there. So these laws affect all of us. Missouri spent half a million dollars imprisoning Jeff Mazansky. He's now out, as I said, but not before his family grew up. Impatient patient abdicated until he died, living illegally to have some quality of life. The parents treating their daughter face losing her. As a medical professional, I'm of the opinion that it is medical abuse and neglect to not actively advocate for change for our patients. I took some wording from the pr principles of medical ethics. The third article of the American Medical Association says, a physician shall respect the law and also recognize the responsibility to seek changes in those requirements which are contrary to the best interests of the patient. And as we've seen and, and heard about these people, these, those are only a few of the stories that I've, I've seen and heard about. Uh, these laws aren't helping us. So come back and talk to me afterward. Thank you. <laughs>